Welcome to What's My Thesis. I'm your host, Javier Proenza. Every week, my guests and I share the answers we found to the questions we have. Join us as we explore and expand our worldview through research and ask, what's my thesis? And uh, today, my guest is Sophia Heftersmith, which I always, I, I love like reading because it's one of those names that I can imagine like a drill sergeant in some like McHale's Navy type show going after Smith. <laughs> That's really funny. Usually people don't like pronounce it right off the bat. Um, really? Yeah. Like people will call me like, like Heifer Smith. Heifer Smith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> does that, does that ever make you feel weird? I mean, no, I think it's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was listening to a podcast and, uh, there's like a cultist who, who gave the name, like, you know, one of the things that cults do is rename people yeah, like so that their past life is gone and they're like somebody new yeah. and her, her name was Hagula or Hagula. And I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> <That's very interesting. laughs> and she was one of his most devout people. Like, uh, it was this guy, uh, I forget. It was a French guy, but his it, it was him and the Ant Hill gang or the Ant Hill Kids were the name of the cult. So okay. I just recently learned about that, which is fun. That's really and, interesting. And uh, are you at all into any of that stuff, true crime and whatnot? I actually am. Okay, so you're yeah. a little bit of a nerd into that. Yeah. Have you yeah. watched the Night Stalker documentary? I have not. I've heard a lot about it, and I heard it's really good, but I've not seen it yet. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to check it out, but uh, or all the way through, but yeah. I've started some of it. And like, I work in that area, in the Monterey Park, Rosemead area. So it's like, now I'm like really excited. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> that shit happened. Because yeah. <laughs> like, and then one of the things that's weird is that like, that's like toxic landfill dumps, like, like uh, landfill sites that are like just uh, wide open, uh, you know, like over there. So I, I think that might have to do a little with, I don't know. It just adds something weird to the vibe. I still haven't seen the documentary, so I can't. I know who Richard Ramirez is, and I'm like familiar with him, but I haven't seen the documentary as it's been made. So it's been a while since I remember all that. Yeah. Who's your favorite serial killer? I don't know. Okay, so my thing about it is like I don't know if I'm, I'm like super into like I don't have like a favorite serial killer. Okay. <laughs> but. The the podcast that I listen to, the people that host it are really funny. Is it and last so, podcast on the left? No, it's uh, my favorite brooder. Okay, yeah, yeah. I've used to listen to them. Yeah. And uh, there's another one called Morbid, but they're both of the people that host it. They're really funny, and so. But I also really like the thing about true crime. I really like puzzle solving and kind of uh -huh. like figuring out like things that happen because like you don't get to see really what's happening during the murder so like when it all comes together it's like oh my god that makes so much sense or like that's yeah. not what i was expecting so i just think it's really interesting yeah i was just listening to one about john benet ramsey and it's it it's always fun when there's like not a lot of information because that's when it gets crazy with the conspiracies yeah. You yeah. know, like when, when people don't really know what happened, then it's all bets are off. It's yeah, like, <laughs> he gets all these like weird stories that come out and people start making shit up and you're just like, what's well, true and what's not. <laughs> yeah. If you like, uh, if you like, I mean, I know that this is weird to start a podcast plugging other podcasts, but if you like that, <laughs> check out, if you like my favorite murder, check out, uh, it's three dudes. So maybe the vibe is different. Uh -huh. Cause I think one of the things that kind of got a little bit uh, alienating for me was just how precious they are about the community huh. of people that are like, you know, like my favorite murder yeah. to me is kind of like a bunch of women discovering that they're not alone. Whereas like <laughs> people have been into true crime forever. So for me, that's a little bit yeah. like what, <laughs> like, you know, yeah, uh, it's not like yeah. a new phenomenon. So for me, for, for me, when they like, when they're like at the end of every episode, they're like, you know, it's you guys and us and we found each other. And I'm like, bro, you guys just talk about fucking murder. <laughs> You're making it this special thing about women empowerment. It's like, y'all are just a bunch of morbid fucks like me. Like, it, it's not. <laughs> yeah. they're, not funny. they're definitely funny. But, uh, but yeah. yeah. 
No, I see what you're saying. I'm definitely into a different flavor. And they had some weird stuff. Like they've definitely had some, uh, some stuff where they've gotten into trouble with like minorities, you know, and, uh, and racist. Yeah. They had a thing where they like, it, I don't even want to recount it because I'm not okay. trying to throw shade at any podcast that's more successful than mine. <laughs> Cause you know, one day I will be like, and you know what my artist community, <laughs> I couldn't have done it we're without you. <laughs> and we're just a bunch of artists and we needed to find each other, you know, and everybody thought we were weirdos and creepy and we were lame at parties, you know? <laughs> Yeah. So you get it. Okay. But no, I totally I totally like uh like I used to listen to it pretty religiously. Uh but yeah. the the thing I like about last podcast last podcast is that it's just uh they do like multiple episode in-depth deep dives. So if you want to okay, feel yeah. like shit for a few weeks, you can, gotcha. you know. Gotcha. So <laughs> <laughs> so are you in LA? I, I I don't I'm not even sure how you ended up in my uh in my Instagram radar. That's funny. Um, I'm actually in Costa Mesa. You're in Costa Mesa, so that's like how yeah. far from here? Like an hour. It's, okay, uh, Is, and that's like on the coast? Yeah, it's um I would hope so. It has coast you never know here in California, <laughs> but it has Spanish coast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it could just as easily uh, not have a coast. Um, it's funny. It's like it's right, um, kind of in between or a part of like Newport Beach and uh, Huntington. Okay. Huntington. So, so it's like, uh, there's a lot of it's a, it's south of here then. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. South. And w- like, how long did you grow up out there, or are you from there? I, I actually grew up in Laguna Beach, and then uh, recently moved to Costa Mesa. I think last summer and mm-hmm. I've been for a couple months now but I really like it how long uh, uh so how old are you actually is the question now I, <laughs> I'm 19 you're 19 oh my god I think you might actually be the youngest person that I've had on the show I oh, have cool. so many questions off the fucking oh ground. you okay <laughs> <laughs> This is almost like I'm this close to you needing parental consent <laughs> to oh be uh, to speak publicly, <clears throat> speak for yourself. You're just like a fresh adult. Holy shit! Yeah. yeah. So, so wait, you might actually be too young to even like remember the show Laguna Beach. I remember that show. Okay, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how long ago it happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my. I, my sis, some of my sister's friends were like the younger siblings of uh, the people on the show. Wow. And she's older, yeah. I'm t- I take it. What? She's older, I take it. Yeah, she, <laughs> she's, uh, <laughs> she's 23, 24. 24, oh, good sister. 23, 23. All right. Uh, she lives in Montana now, but... Yeah. So that explains a lot of how I, 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 of like your, your Instagram feed. Cause it's like, it is like, you know, one of the things that I thought was funny and I was going to give you like, you know, like playful shit because I okay. never see you yeah. and your crew wearing masks. <laughs> okay. This Do people is the give you shit about that on Instagram or no? I don't know. But okay. So when, when we're, like together we have a very specific like group of people yeah. that we hang out with. And, it is the same uh, people every time. Yeah, it's it's always the same people. And because there's always people at my house next door because we took over the warehouse next door to us mm. and we like turned it into a little like uh working studio. So it's like we're always around the same people and yeah. it's like always the same. We're all very careful. Like I have to be really careful because my parents are older, so like mm. And they're still in Laguna, so if I go and see them, you know, yeah, so I'm very cautious still. But um, it's always yeah, it's always the same people. Yeah, yeah. No, I was, I, but it looks like you guys are uh, like one of the few people in the world that are having fun right now because of that, because you've got your own little bubble. The other thing is yeah. that like also when you're 18, I know like maybe if you were in your 20s, uh-huh. like when you're 18, your your social circle is still pretty small compared to like once you once you get a little bit older and you start going to college. Cause I mean, I, this well, is, you're 19, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, I, 
you are you are you going to school right now? No, I'm not. I'm no, I, I, that's not a judgment. I don't. I mean, you're painting. That's fine. Okay. You're not, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> no, I just it'd, it'd be cool. I would I would love to go to art school. It's just really expensive. I know. I'm with you. So yeah. I, that's why that's why I don't. I, that's why I support people that don't go to school and, and like have people that don't go to school all the time on the show. Yeah. Uh, namely myself, I don't have an MFA. <laughs> so, but yeah, no. Um, so then you are sort of in this like transitional period. I don't know. It's been so long since I was like, I had just graduated <laughs> high school and then you're kind of an adult and you have this like option where you can go and postpone adulthood by yeah. going to like college or like you have to sort of fucking cope. You know? Well, the the interesting thing is for I feel like I kind of got a jump start because I did homeschooling uh, the last two years of my high school and started uh-huh. working like oh. while I was homeschooling. So I've kind of been like doing my own thing for a couple years now. What like, what what kind of work were you doing? Um, I was doing a lot of like styling, um, and I was signed to like a modeling agency for a while and then uh just as a stylist or as a model as a model and then okay. uh, i did just like trying to make money off of work and uh like my artwork and just trying to hone in on my style and my, my last year of high school high school doing homeschooling was basically basically just uh art history classes so okay yeah, it was, it was fun but is that so through homeschooling that's kind of how you figured out that you wanted to to like uh to be an artist and start painting and stuff like that or were you into that before i have my both of my parents paint and okay. so and like i have a lot of members that were artists or do creative things and so since i was a little girl like mm-hmm. always knew that's what i wanted to do yeah yeah well, so what, it's, like, it's very, very what specific so specifically painting just i guess uh Cause I've seen some of your work and, and, and it's like, uh, it doesn't come off like you haven't been to, like, it seems like you probably wouldn't need to go to art school to have someone get you to the same place that you are now, you know, like, uh, uh, so, so it's interesting. I mean, uh, like what, how, how, what, cause painting to me has always been somewhat of an elusive thing in, uh-huh. in terms of, as a contemporary medium, I'm not necessarily that well versed, even in like Basquiat and and yeah. and all of that, you know. Yeah. Um, but but uh, like it, but there seems like there's definitely like you definitely have a voice or a style or something, right? Like it's not, and it doesn't come off like a gimmick. So, yeah. like you're eight, you're 19 now. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel you ended up getting there? Like what? Cause like, you know, there's always the virtuoso myth, but then there's also like, if you have support when you're young, obviously yeah. it seems like you've had that. Right. Yeah. And you've had cl- critical discourse within your nucleus. You've had it outside of an educational system necessarily. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so um, what, but how, how do you feel like that? Like, it seems like you're kind of ahead of the curve on what people go to college to do. So yeah. like, how do you think, like for somebody that wants to just kind of do it on their own, self-impose this kind of thing and like maybe not go to school and get to somewhere where you are, where you're sort of like in this place where you're comfortable with, you've definitely had time to work on your stuff, right? So yeah. let me know more about that. Um, so my, my parents are very like, they're hippies. Okay. <laughs> um, but like, I think you're too young for them to be hippies. Technically, my mom had me when she was thirty, forty-two. But she, what did she? What, how old was she in the sixties? Uh, my my. Oh, dad, she was forty-two when she had you. Okay, that yeah. that's that so tracks. My dad's sixty-four. My mom's sixty-two. Okay. All right. So. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They could yeah. be. They could be. Yeah, I'm like, damn. They're both <laughs> baby boomers. So, uh, but they're, they're just like, they've always been really supportive of everything I've done. Um, and so there was a lot like growing up, my garage was like fully turned into an art studio that both my parents worked in. Mm -hmm. And so I was always in there with them or doing my own thing in there. And then I went to the school in Laguna called Annalise's, which is this 
kind of like language, uh, arts and like gardening with like animals. It was another hippie school. Mm -hmm. So that was like very much, um, very supportive in the way that I like express myself and like all the kids there. And so growing up doing that and then going to public school, which I hated. Mm -hmm. Um, but once I, I think, yeah, once I left high school, I started hanging out in San Clemente, which is south of Costa Mesa, like closer to uh, San Diego. And I found, I came across, I was going to the thrift store. I came across this um, studio in this huge warehouse. And this woman invited me in and it was just like art Narnia. And there was like the most, <laughs> seriously, that was like, stuff everywhere there was art everywhere like materials there's a bunch of people working um and I started talking to her and I would go back there and be like I'll trade work to like work in here with you guys like I'll do anything and so uh they let me start working in there in exchange for studio space and uh what kind of did you assist them as an artist assistant did you assist in terms of running the space (laughs) Uh, basically, the artist that own it is her name's uh, Diana and James Hill. They're this older couple. Um, they used to like they were like OG like Soho dwellers in the in the sixties and seventies, mm-hmm. and um, lived in New York and stuff. And James uh, James Hill, he's one of like the most incredible painters I've ever seen. Definitely mm-hmm. a big influence on me. Uh, Diana is a really wonderful ceramicist. And uh, what I would do is because James would make like five paintings a day and had so much work. I was in charge of photographing and cataloging everything. Okay. And so I would go in there for a couple hours and then I would bring my materials and I'd work some like someplace in the studio. And after a couple months of doing that, I came in one day and they had like a little space set out for me with an easel. (laughs) And so I spent the next two and a half years working there. And that's cool. where. How I old think, were you at this time? I think I was like in between, like I was 17 going on 18. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So I spent like three, two and a half years working there. Um, and the first year I spent a lot of time working alongside James. And then there's two other artists that work in there, uh, John Giannotti and Marco. <clears throat> I don't know his last name, but. Those were like my teachers. Like they all mm-hmm. fully took me in and taught me so many important lessons. They've all like been around the block, have done the whole thing and are just like keep keep making things. And so that was like my schooling. And uh, so yeah. you didn't go to like a specific art magnet school or anything like that. You just kind of you had an interest and you sort of pursued it, which is something that not, like because I mean, I got a D in my art. Uh, class in high school like which is something that's so fucking crazy to me (laughs) now because like it was a different kind of program you know like the the art teachers what is that what is that i'm getting an echo i'm getting an echo an echo Uh uh-oh uh-oh it's i don't know why it's coming it's I don't this know why it's coming. Oh my god, your face is not blank. I thought there was something behind me. You scared the shit off me. No, it's my <laughs> voice echoing back. Oh, okay, got you. I guess it stopped. All right. If like okay. there's something that Zoom does to sort of cancel out your own voice when you record. And I guess it just fa- oh, it was weird. faulty for a second there. But um so yeah, so that's interesting because like to some degree, it's not necessarily like the traditional um, you know, there's a lot of shit that like, uh, gets into like people's heads about how you have to go about becoming an artist and what is validating. And at this point, I, I'm starting to be of the mind that if you don't want to teach art as like an adjunct or anything like that, then an MFA doesn't really necessarily make sense. Right. You can surround yourselves with with artists. That's kind of what I'm doing with the show. This show is essentially my attempt to sort of do something similar to what you did, just, you know, 
as a midlife crisis instead of like young ambition, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's really interesting to me because uh, because it's basically like that's basically what I'm trying to do. Just like know people and and yeah. you know, I guess at this point I've I'm not I'm not. Uh, I ha I did go to some school and I did, I went to my undergrad for like seven years because <laughs> I didn't I, I I didn't want to like leave and I was so obsessed with learning so this is my way of staying in school without paying my fucking you know I took advantage of yeah. like UN money <laughs> to go to school yeah. for that long all right so it's not yeah. like it was on my parents but uh or yeah. maybe some of it was <laughs> if i'm being real because i don't think you uncovered seven years straight i just went to a, an affordable school called fiu but you know and obviously there's like um we're, we're definitely coming from a specific class perspective both you and i right in terms of this because you're living yeah. in laguna beach you're, you're you're going to you know i grew up in italy there are some fringe yeah. benefits that are associated with this privilege. So I don't want to be like, oh, it's that fucking easy, you know, <laughs> but you're also coming from privilege and you've, you're making a choice not to go to school because it's too expensive either way. Right. So that's yeah. how expensive school has gotten. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, definitely. No, I feel like it's very, it's very interesting, like coming from, yeah a small bubble of a town with, mm -hmm. like really zero diversity and just like because I grew up there it was like you know it's that's like all I know uh I've lived on the same street my whole entire life so until mm -hmm. I moved here and, so, and then going and like working in LA and meeting all these new people and like seeing really how the world works <laughs> in an actual sense was mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it, was, it was really exhilarating because I was like, oh, I can really live my life the way I want to. And yeah. with that being said, I do have the privilege to do that. Yeah. Uh, because of just like my background and the support I have like emotionally from my parents. And so mm. um, uh, I am financially independent. <laughs> so there <laughs> are limitations and I have been for a really long time so um but you know it's uh it's definitely a very exciting time for me in my life even though it's really weird because of all this COVID shit but um yeah. I'm trying to be as respectful in that sense as I can while still trying to like make a go at it but also like uh I like that you've you've managed to do like it's almost like you guys have like your little covid commune which is cool you yeah know? For sure. um it's it's almost like you're in art school without being in art school it sounds like I right? know. it's it's so, definitely yeah. because i because i was given that chance to be around really incredible artists and have them give me an environment where i was able to explore so much and have so many lessons from practicing artists I wanted to, and how important that was for me to mm. be around artists and to learn from them. Uh, coming to Costa Mesa, I, I didn't know anybody. I moved here during quarantine. So I, you know, I, I can't really meet anybody. And so the way that mm. I was able to like kind of create my own community here was to find all the artists mm -hmm. and, you know, so I kind of collected them all up and I'm still meeting new ones they all kind of like hide in their corners yeah. but um and so just being able to like provide space for people to work and create and to like bounce ideas off each other and that's really important to me and I I thought if I was able to like provide that for other people it'd be cool. there's also a nice thing that like I'm assuming there's a lot of your own peers there right like people your own age or um it it really ranges like I oh so there are older people trying to fuck younger people there then <laughs> I was like at least that's a difference between that and college but then no uh, it's the same shit yeah, uh, <laughs> pretty much um but yeah <laughs> I feel like that's that's gonna happen everywhere you go well you know at least there's not institutional power behind it you know I mean maybe so it's more like when uh 
uh, well, you know, it's more like when a comedian sleeps with his opener than <laughs> than a professor, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but it's, it's still like kind of weird. I mean, whatever. Yeah. I'm not. I don't mean to throw shade. Who knows if I'll fall in love with this 18 year old one day? <laughs> you know, you never know, bro. Harold and Maude was such a great movie, and all women love that one. Have you seen it? Yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> I'm not like just because I'm 19. I'm not unaware of. No, good. I'm not. I'm laughing. I'm not laughing at you being young. I mean, I get, I'm surprised that you've seen it. I'm not laughing about that. I'm laughing because I literally just said, "Yeah, women love that movie." <laughs> oh, I didn't even hear that part. <laughs> but if it, was, if, if it was, uh, if it was the other way around, if it was like a really fucking old dude and a young lady, and they were both like kind of weirdos, like yeah. <laughs> they were both free spirits, it would be like, what a fucking creep. And, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily the wrong take. Yeah. There's definitely an imbalance of power. You know, we'd live in a patriarchy and all of that. But I always think it's funny that, like, you know, women fantasize about young men loving them in their old age, too. <laughs> I, I mostly see it as, like, I just think he's a really strange person. I think they're just, like, very strange people in it. Yeah. And I think it's very amusing, but... I see what you're saying. And, I, <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, who knows? I may someday be a, four, a you know, 50 year old, 60 year old who dates an 18 year old. It's perfectly legal, right? <laughs> as, as long as it's consensual. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the key. But as then, long then, as then you have some young girl <laughs> change in the basement, you're all good. <laughs> <laughs> well, there comes that true crime part. <laughs> All right, so we've been talk shooting shit for a bit, but do you have a topic today? I do. And okay. I think you'll <laughs> <laughs> so basically, my topic is the idea and the practice of making bad art. Okay. Like, yeah. so, so intentionally bad art or bad art, like with tongue in cheek, like so that it's good? It's not so much about what it looks like. Rather, the notion of not caring what it looks like. Okay. And so, enable some like I for me the the reason I called it making bad art is because I know when I label it as that, there's something that switches in my brain that whatever the outcome is, I will be like okay with whatever it looks like because uh -huh. I'm like if it looks bad, that's what I'm going for. If it looks good, oh my god, what a surprise. <laughs> you know? It's kind of like this win-win situation. <laughs> when it looks good, you're like, "Oh my god, it's such a good failure." <laughs> Cuz you were shooting to make bad art, but it's good and then like you're like, "Oh, I can live with failing that way." <laughs> exactly. So tell me uh, more, tell me more. So I I've been like having a hard time getting back into the practice of making a lot of work because usually I'm like constantly creating things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it where, where did the interruption come? Definitely. Uh, part of the move. It was part of the move, but also after I had my first solo show, um, I had all this, I, so basically before quarantine happened, I was supposed to have a, my first solo show at this gallery called Ghost Gallery in LA. Mm -hmm. I spent two Familiar. months. Like, yeah, I spent like two months morning and night making shit, like waking up at 5 a.m., working on a lot, a lot of large pieces. And then a week before my opening, everything got shut down. Yeah. And so uh, months and months and months and months passed and my work was just sitting in the gallery um and so the, the shows the show still open like to limited like attendance no so it was it it got postponed for a really long time and then um they ended up just not doing it and so a gallery that i've worked with before doing group shows that i've become really good friends with um shit art club they asked me to bring all my work that i had done for that solo show to their gallery and do it there Mm -hmm. And so I was able to show it and it was in like a by appointment kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really awesome and really incredible, but it was like, 
I think it was because I had this momentum of, of doing things like every single day and making all this stuff. Um, and then to be completely cut off because I had to leave my studio because the, the couple that owns it, they're, um, I think in their seventies and I couldn't be around them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so yeah, I had to leave sense. there. Um, and so I ended up, <laughs> my studio became outside of my house in a, in a easy up tent. <laughs> tent, <by> tent. <laughs> and it rained for like, th- like so long. And I was just outside, like we taped up like a plastic sheeting and I just like was bundled up and spent hours outside painting in the rain. And this is near LA, which is like, it doesn't rain very often, right? Oh no, it does not. <laughs> it, not at all. I was just like, this is the most depressing shit I've ever. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? But um, I had to leave my studio. My show got closed. But after that, um, I moved here and I was working inside of, my home and then we got the warehouse next door and moved over there but everything kind of because I felt like I had nothing to there was for I don't know why but in my head like there's nothing in the future that's gonna happen oh so (laughs) So, you're saying no deadlines was hard to deal with yeah yeah Yeah, pretty much I I can I think a lot of people can relate to that like I, I definitely work best under pressure. Was there uh, also a sense of like uh, post show depression kind of thing, where it's like, all right, I did it, and then it's like, eh. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it was. I've never experienced that before because I obviously haven't had a lot of shows before. But <laughs> like, an, a, like my my dad called it that or something, and I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, that's a thing. And he's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So but like, I, think it was, I think it was definitely had to do with that. Yeah. So, but basically I started, I was like trying to make work and I just felt like everything was super repetitive mm-hmm. and I just, nothing new was coming to mind. And I just felt like it was just shit. And I was like, Oh, I'm making such bad artwork and like getting so down on myself and getting angry. And then I was just like, you know, it's okay. It's okay to make bad artwork it's a part of the process and funneling yeah. out like bad shit to make the good stuff. And so I started kind of like this practice of like, I'm just going to sit down and release whatever comes out. And there is no pressure for it to look good or it to be like the next great masterpiece or, you know, <laughs> to be in some sort of like art show or some, and it's literally just the act of making art and that's it. Mm-hmm. It's like, almost like art therapy it's like meditative and it's you know because like art for me at least growing up was very like therapeutic and healing and so I'm trying to get back in the space of just making art for the sake of it and trying to kind of hone in on that like energy of kind of like transformative I don't know it's just, it's, it's mostly a feeling, but I think it, it's so important to do that because um, for me, being in that state, I've done a lot of uh, experimentation mm-hmm. and there's no pressure to like be in the sort of like aesthetic of the work that I do. Yeah. It's kind of, like I get to just put down on paper or canvas, whatever feels good instead of thinking what will look good. You know, Can you tell me more about like so you do you sometimes feel it trapped by the aesthetic and the expectation of like what your what your voice has developed into? Yeah, so that that I think my biggest fear as an artist is being like trapped into doing like one thing. Do you know who uh DeKiriko is? That sounds I forget different. his first name. He's a painter that painted in a very particular style. And um, it's crazy because he started to try to break out of it. I don't want to burden you with this story, okay? Because <laughs> it doesn't turn out well. Because, it, I mean, it's not like true crime turned out bad. But, uh, you know, it's not like he shot himself and five other people. <laughs> it was okay. more of a, 
it was more of a to 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 make a living. He had to start painting like himself again, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. And I've been to his apartment in uh, I think it's Piazza Venezia, like uh, in Italy, which was pretty cool. And to see that and hear the story in that space and be like, oh man, he still had a really nice apartment though. I would <laughs> <laughs> I would sell out to live here. <laughs> no, but no, that, no. that. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, I was just I I feel like you see that with so many artists like. For example, like Shepherd Fairy. Yeah, yeah. Like, his stuff was really cool when he started out, and it was very innovative but, and new. But I think the just, sure, the, turning it into a shirt company also makes it, exactly, you know. Exactly, makes it very repetitive. But even, like, you think about um, Gaston and, like, his early works, and then the second he started painting, like, more figuratively, people were like, this is shit. Yeah, Like, yeah. what are you doing? Kind of thing. So I kind of, in my practice, make it a point to try – and go yeah. down a lot of different avenues and explore a lot of different things and put it all out there as much as I can. And at the same time, it does end up in the same kind of realm of my style, yeah. which is cool because I was worried that I wouldn't have a style, mm-hmm. but it's like becoming more and more clear as I make more work is that it's very, I do have a style <laughs> like specific to me. And so, um, yeah. Well, I would caution you from saying style because style implies like a certain aesthetic, whereas uh, voice, I think, is maybe a more broader term that can like, uh, you know, because I identify with that. When I first started my like the things that I was into and started to actually get, I have like the good fortune of being a conceptual artist, which is basically what you you were just describing. But instead of just like with painting, it's like with all things yeah it's kind of a cheat because like but then at a certain (laughs) point you start you sort of do have to start unifying it all right like it becomes hard to like have um but then at the same time it's not hard (laughs) it's almost easy because it's still you making the work and you're thinking about the same things it's uh, similar themes so I can I can totally relate to that what um do you have like so when I I feel like that's really interesting what you're saying, but um, how do you keep yourself? Like, for example, it can also go too far in one direction where I'm like, just like, um, like just how do you keep yourself from overwhelming some, like a work and still being oh. evaluating it instead of overworking it while you're trying to make something bad. Does the making okay. something bad, do you feel like it gives you like f- freedom to say, Oh, this is done when you f- like earlier than you would. Yeah, I know. I definitely, I've, I've always had like a very strong sense of like when something's done to me, I like, I don't touch it. Yeah. You know, like I'm very like, this is done. The second it's done, I put it away. I don't mess with yeah. it anymore. Um, but yeah, so I, I just like, I don't know if calling it making bad artwork is like the best term, but in my mind, that's what it's evocative. And I think I get it, you know? Yeah. You know, it's it's like, there's something in my brain that like clicks when I make that statement to myself, it's like almost some sort of like ego death of myself as like an, at least as an artist, Mm -hmm. as like how I um, interact with the work I'm making and go about the work I'm making and leaving room for enjoyment instead Mm -hmm. of like pressure, you know? And so that's pretty much like, that has led me to be able to go back to making, because I'm in the practice of making work all the time now, because I have, I've given myself the freedom to make whatever kind of, in this like practice of making work, um, I'm able to create new images for myself. Whereas mm. when I felt stuck, I was making like a lot of the same thing over and over again. It was kind yeah. of just like, this like void of like faces and boobs. And I was like, I can't get out. <laughs> so yeah. I could live in that space for a little while though. <laughs> I mean, I'm still just kissing everything. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Yeah. In that universe. Yeah. No, I can relate to that. And I, one of the things that I do, uh, 
a lot now is I just come up with arbitrary drawing systems and commit to them regardless of like how it's going to end up looking, which can yeah. be a little frustrating because I do end up tossing a lot of drawings or feeling like they're not good. So now I'm trying to go back into the other way of like, okay, like one of the things that I did, I, I still don't know if I'm going to release it because there's still a lot of work to do, but I've been trying to do like videos of actual draw of these actual drawing systems and stuff like that to sort of get, um, and for me, the reason to do that is not so much because I don't think a lot of people are watching my YouTube channel right now, <laughs> right? It, there's a lot more people that listen to the podcast as a podcast than watch it on YouTube. But yeah. the, uh, the um, <clears throat> I think what it does for me is it makes me commit because sometimes I'll get into making drawings and then in, I'll do the opposite. I'll end before it's done just because I, yeah. I, it's like, it's so fucking involved. And then yeah. with, with, I feel like, and this is no dig on painting, but I feel like with painting, you can paint over, but like ink on paper sometimes can just be so stressful. The deeper you get into the drawing, you know? So I have had to sort of be like, Hey, like do a balance of both. Like I need to finish it for sure, and I need to, you know, so it, it's interesting to hear you talk about that because there is like, um, there's like, not in your case, but there is a danger of just not being committed to something if you don't care about it, right? So now it's more of like, but I like I like the idea of like the freedom that that gives you and then also the idea of um, just plowing forward and actually putting committing something to paper. Because if you start getting too much into like pre-writing of your paper, <laughs> you know, yeah. you can fucking write a paper, like an entire paper in your head, but until you start putting exactly. it down, you know, you're fucked. <laughs> exactly. exactly. You got to draft it. So like part of that is like, I got to finish three bad drawings to learn what I need to learn to make that fifth one. And then exactly. that can be a frustrating part that's, of the process. Yeah. That's, that's the point. It's, but it's, it, it's being okay with that yeah and like accepting that i think there's a lot of myth in the way that we think about ourselves as artists too right because no one else is expected to just crap out something like you know no one writes his fucking spreadsheet perfectly on their first try you know like exactly. these things take fucking like that's why people, people have time to do it at their jobs right like uh yeah. so it, it it's interesting it's an interesting conversation in terms of like the uh because what we're sort of getting in, in, into is like the you're kind of when you're trying to make like there's a lot of stuff a lot of industry and a lot of work in the world I'm part of it I, I I have a job where I do the same shit over and over again right and there's like and that's considered a good job right yeah. <laughs> whereas when you're trying to fucking do things that are like out of comfort zones and stuff it, it you sort of have to have this like mechanism that makes it okay to fuck up because, you know, so it's a completely different, like, working it's mechanism. There's, it's, there's room for it, you know? There's room to fuck up in that yeah. field, you know? Or, like, if you're an analyst or, like, a bridge builder, you can't fuck up, you know? Yeah. Um, but it but goes... I think, Sorry, go ahead. I, I was just saying that I think that I think it, we're very, um, as artists, very uh, privileged to have that space. Yeah. You know? I think that they don't, that people don't actually give us that space. I, what, what I, what, what I feel is that I think that like a lot of, you know, like a lot of the thing, this is just going back, going into like one of the most typical things is like people asking you to do work for free for exposure. They, th they there is this myth that like it didn't take work or training or anything like that. It's like, you're just good at that. Why can't you just do it for me? You're just fucking good at it. I'm not good at it. It's like, yeah, you didn't fucking spend all your, your life learning how to do it. Right. Yeah. You know, so it's like this invalidation. And I think that we internalize that attitude towards us when we're making yeah. work. And, and I think that like, that's when, that's when you said ego death, I think that that's what triggered is like, we have this idea of like, well, if I'm not a good artist, like, what am I even doing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm wasting think, everybody's time. <laughs> including my own. No, ex no, I like, I totally 
I totally get what you're saying. I, I definitely feel that. And that's, that's the thing is like, that's where I'm at right now is the, the ego death of the artist of being like, I have to make a bunch of good work and everybody has to like it. And I have to like it and all that, you know, that pressure yeah. of like, if it's, if, because we are artists and we depend on our good artwork to sell and to make our living. And if we don't make good artwork, we're fucked. Mm -hmm. There's so much pressure that we put on ourselves and that other put people put on us. And um, so I'm trying to release that yeah. in a responsible way with still <laughs> being able to like take care of myself financially, but also have the practice of like pushing things through. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. It's tough. It's not an easy thing because everything in it, like the whole world as it exists now, even like, even there was a time where like artistry mattered, especially in American culture, right? Like they don't, there's been this thing with uh, the new Democrats for a long time where they, the, the, the neoliberalism, you've heard the term, I'm sure it's like everybody's saying, but essentially what that is, is the idea that there is no such thing as a free space, right? There is no such thing as a, like everything is monetized. And in that space, I feel like art and artists definitely get choked because there's, you know, it is a leisure activity. And to some degree, there's a reason that we two people of at least middle class are having this conversation, right? Yeah. Because because the reality is, is that we have the resources to have the leisure time to do this. We're not fucking, right? Like that's the reality of it. We've had the support, financial or otherwise, emotional also, because it takes some of that. Um, but then even then I've had support from my parents, but their understanding of art is so fucked up that like their advice was terrible to me. <laughs> no, I mean, I love them very much, but like, you know, they, they, their idea of like what my life would be like as an artist and how that would pan out. I had to sort of teach them about the reality of the world be like, no, <laughs> this yeah. isn't how it works. Right. Like, so, so it, it's, it's, uh, I think that there's a lot of, things that it's it's actually really impressive to talk to someone 19 years old that's like on that path and that and and i'm excited that people haven't told you that you need to go to school and stuff like that you I've know had people tell me to go to school but it was not for my parents it was from the people that i really looked you know that i've looked up to you yeah that makes but know? i think i think one of the i think that there is like something to be said for school right I'm not bashing it. I would love, absolutely love to go to art school. I can't afford it and I don't want to be in debt for the rest of my life. And, and you're not so, going to be able to make art. That's the parad exactly. That's the paradox. Like, exactly. Yeah. And then... And, I'm gonna have to, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. I was just, I would have to get a nine to five job to pay for my student loans and then I'm, I'm not qualified <laughs> to have a real nine to five job besides like working in a coffee shop. <laughs> yeah. so. and that's a whole business is gone doesn't yeah. exist you can't work at coffee shops anymore and expect to you know <laughs> it's it's a it's an insane thing and uh it's crazy to be an artist right now but congratulations to you for 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 fucking hustling you know mad respect <laughs> and i don't begrudge anybody who does it uh, uh but the other the other thing that is kind of a crazy reality is that then you only have people from a like then you lose diversity in the art world, right? When it's only people from a middle class, like, and I'm not talking about racial diversity because that's the only thing that people want to talk about. There is, in art, there is class, like in the world, there's class diversity. And that is something that is severely lacking, right? Like we function at like maybe the artist run space level. We're not at the Hauser and Worths and all of that, right? Yeah. Like, but, but uh, there's a whole class of people that can't even participate in art and would otherwise yeah. be creative people because they can't, you know. So, yeah. so it's it's always something to keep in mind, like that, like, uh, yeah, it's a privilege, but then like, if you don't do it, who the fuck is gonna do it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. it's, you can't be like, oh man, I'm so lucky that I have these freedoms and I feel guilty about using them, like use them so that other yeah. people can, don't give those away, right? right. So. It's like it's kind of a double-edged sword, but yeah, it's, it's a nice one. <laughs>
Can, can you can you tell me a little bit more before we we close out here? Like, what yeah. is your perspective as a nineteen year old kid? Like, you know, because I know that the stereotype is that like, oh, you kids don't know anything, but you're gonna have like we you, you're coming. Here's how I see it: you're coming into an uh, into a world where everybody has pro, pre programmed ideas of how things are functioning, yeah. and right now. Yeah. Every all of that shit has collapsed for a lot of people. So you're watching a lot of people's words and people and I'm guessing, you know, my experience is that people are trying desperately to hold on to that. What do you see that like how do you tell me more about that? Uh, that's a very like broad. No, that's fine. Take the, take the question how you want to. I, okay. I think that it's very needed the change of perspective mm. for some like some cases um or for a lot of things but i don't know i think i think that huh can you word the question a little bit better <laughs> like yeah, a more like no. well okay i just don't i don't want to lead to, i try to ask non-leading questions sometimes so that's what i was trying to do but that's okay, okay. it can be overwhelming so uh, yeah, like, can... all right so right now you have as much of a realistic job at at, at succeeding as someone who starts a new business in this yeah. world that we live in right yeah, like sure. like whereas i i was a kid it was like artists were like, oh, what the fuck are you going to do with that? Whereas now, yeah. if you want to start a fucking small business, like, what the fuck are you going to do with that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get chewed up next time there's a fucking pandemic or some shit like that. Why would you even waste your fucking time with that shit? You know, so yeah. like, what is that world like? <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's definitely scary. I definitely yeah. it's very scary. And it's definitely a big risk. For me, that is somebody that's considered like a non-essential worker mm -hmm. uh, for this time. But uh, I don't know. I just know it's something that no matter what, if I make any money doing it, if I get any sort of like recognition for what I'm doing, I know I'm going to do it no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so. It's a compulsion. Yeah, it's definitely it's like. It's definitely compulsion. <laughs> That's a great word for it. I, I, it's what I love doing. It's what I've always loved doing. I hate it. I fucking love it. It's <laughs> thing ever. It's the worst thing ever. But it's mine and it's me and it's who I am. And that's like all I can say about that, you know? Yeah. And I think that it's that's good. kind of a key component there. I don't know. I don't know what it is there though that like, it's those two things that you talked about. It's like, it's a compulsion, but then at the same time, it's you and to not yeah. like, that's what makes it a compulsion, right? Like yeah. without being able to do it. I know Freud has this really funny thing uh, uh, that he wrote about the artist where it's like, and it's pretty on the nose, but yeah. I think it, there, there's also like, there's a condescension in the way that he sees artists <laughs> where yeah. it's like, Oh, <laughs> yeah, but he, he kind of is condescending about every diagnosis a little yeah. bit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you want to yeah. suck your mom's tit every time. <laughs> so, so creepy. <laughs> but, like, I, he's definitely projecting him wanting to sleep with his mom. Onto everybody. <laughs> what if we found out that was the case? It was like, Oh yeah. Nope. Only Freud wants to fuck his mom. <laughs> <laughs> so much sense oh my god <laughs> uh, yeah what if it, yeah that's hilarious or what if it was only academics who read freud and freud oh and then that's why it was like just this vast conspiracy um, uh <laughs> you don't you don't want to fuck your mom <laughs> what <laughs> that's crazy i thought everybody wanted to do that <laughs> uh my god i guess that the fact that oedipus well, no, but those guys were, th that was Greece. So Greece was a little weird too. <laughs> <laughs> I love how like everybody's like, democracy, democracy. It's a great ideal from Greece. And then you're like, yeah, they had sex with kids. <laughs> I know. It's and just then like they're like, and so do we. Our most powerful at the top, fuck children. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean... 
it's not it's not too far from the power <laughs> right now. <laughs> really think about it. Uh, but, I'm glad you didn't call me out for conspiracy theories. <laughs> I mean, who fucking knows, dude? There's so much crazy shit in this world. Like, lizard people might exist. You have no idea. <laughs> It's also really fun to talk to young people and then like realize that like, because like a lot of people my age are so entrenched in their like belief system, political or otherwise, that like, I think the level of investment in it is like, like um, any kind of nihilism scares the shit out of them. <laughs> Whereas as it feels like you're like, yeah, let's let it all fucking burn, which is kind of my stance. <laughs> I, being young and like seeing the shit I've seen in my short lifespan and not having the like calm that (laughs) some of you guys have experienced, I'm kind of in this place of like literally anything goes. Yeah, yeah. In a sense. Where it's like, I feel like my generation just has to deal with it. Has to you know, we're the next people that have to like go through all this shit and fight against it and be and lead by example. And so I know from at least me and my friends and the people that I um, have the same views with, we will always fight for what we believe in because yeah. we've always had, to, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so. my gen, my, the, I'm I'm technically uh, a Generation X. I'm the last of the Generation X. So like my whole people, we're the ones that, or like this generation is the one that built uh, Silicon Valley up to what it is kind of yeah. today. Today, and their perception of the world is pretty directly boomerish. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Where they're like, you know, I, one of the things that I love about the boomers is that there was a project called Atoms for Peace, where they were like, yeah, we'll just fucking frack with nuclear weapons. <laughs> and then the 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 oil and the gas, oh no, sorry, the gas was contaminated with radiation. So it was fucking useless. They're like, yeah. we'll make a canal, like the Panama, the Panama Canal. It's like just these like hard-ons for like, we're going to fucking destroy, you know, like this mountain, we're going to take this part off and like, <laughs> you know. Fully rape the earth. Yeah. Yeah where it's like and then and i think that like uh i think that the uh, generation x and the tech community is very much like we're gonna rape your fucking mind (laughs) (laughs) pretty much (laughs) anyway i hope uh i hope you had fun today uh, do you I have did. stuff that you want to do? Good. I, uh, uh, I, now I understand why you were a little bit nervous, but I, I, I always had faith in you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to have had a 19 year old on the show. Uh, mm-hmm. Not very many opportunities that I get to talk to them. So I will definitely have you back on. And uh, if you've got yeah. some more youngins that you can re- reference, uh, refer me to, I would definitely be down to hear what they yeah. have to say. If you have like the most conspiracy theory minded of your friends, send that motherfucker over to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I already have somebody in mind. That like, <laughs> okay. I want to talk like what, uh, like I want to talk with the most conspiracy minded uh, uh, Zoomer <laughs> or Generation Z. <laughs> Sorry, Zoomer is offensive, I think. Zoomer. <laughs> um, I think he's in his 30s though i don't know oh, he's in his 30s oh no no i want a young kid who believes in q no okay <laughs> oh my god um, i'm down to get weird bro it's so weird, weird. here but yeah, yeah anyway do you have stuff that you want to promote do you like we can promote your instagram which is rita callow which is uh i for a long time i thought your name was rita <laughs> it's yeah. a nickname they gave me when i was really i think in middle school or something and it just stuck Uh and then uh she's like it sounds like Rita Kahlo and then I was like Rita Kahlo and it was (laughs) kind of like this inside joke between me Uh and her um so yeah there's my Instagram uh are you on uh sorry uh I was gonna plug shit art club the gallery I work with okay they're the best they're Mm -hmm. They like have totally created the most amazing community of artists. Um, Where is that in Costa Mesa? 
No, that's that's in downtown LA, like right next oh. to Sk- Skid Road on uh, like Los Angeles and Fourth, like right on the corner. Oh, I was just there today in that area. <laughs> cool. It is uh, yeah. like Skid Row is like downtown now. It's not just Skid Row anymore. Skid Row. Oh, is- I know. For people in, uh, who are not from LA, Skid Row is the homeless area. Basically, in downtown, it's not. It, it like I've heard people say that like every bridge in the in LA is has people sleeping under it. It's now it's gone beyond that. Any really any sidewalk, sorry, any sidewalk that all- does not have a storefront. So if you see if you see like any alley, anything yeah. that doesn't have a store open to the street, there's people living in tents. Everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. There's. It's insane. I swear every single time I go up to LA, it gets worse. And I'm there a lot. (laughs) I live right next to downtown and it's worse than the last time I went. Yeah. And I went like a couple weeks ago. (laughs) It's it's progressively, like this shit is happening. It's weird. You can't necessarily like uh, see it on the television, but if you live in the areas, it's fucking happening. I want to confirm. It's not like, it's not made up guys. (laughs) Uh, so anyway, yeah. then shit gallery, and then what else? Sure. Yeah, else? Sure. Um, uh, yeah, art gallery, shit gallery. <laughs> shit gallery. Um, uh, That's know. it. You have a website. I, I, I'm working on that. Okay. Working on a catalog uh, and a website, and I don't know. All right. Like really hard you're gonna you're gonna help me mark at corner the 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 young demographic the generation z demographic (laughs) (laughs) it's funny because you're like oh yeah bringing in all the young people and i'm like most of my friends are like in their 30s (laughs) i get that vibe yeah uh, (laughs) but yeah well it's been a lot of fun talking to you i'll uh, I'll definitely talk to you again at some point and uh yeah that'd be awesome Right. Well, it's so funny because I, I listened to your podcast and then I was like listening to your podcast and then you DM me and I was like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> <laughs> That's so hilarious. I'm like, yeah. I don't, I never know who listens because like I, in my <laughs> mind, it's like, it, it's nobody. <laughs> no, and, then, like, and then when people tell me they listen to it and I was like, I definitely did not anticipate a 19 year old listening to the show. <laughs> 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 so I'm like, oh, hell yeah. That means that I'm not an old curmudgeon, even though that's what I am. Or that like 18 year olds like, or 19 year olds like old curmudgeon types, you know? There's value to that, to being a bitter old man. <laughs> In my mind, I'm like 64. So I'm like, I'm way ahead of you. What are you talking about? No, I'm, joking, I'm joking. I lean the fuck into it, bro. I get so <laughs> about everything. <laughs> All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Bye.